Uh, hello, everybody. This is Gino Johnson, CEO of Champions for Veterans, and I am so excited to say uh, welcome. Oh, thank you for listening to uh, the Combos with Heroes podcast. It's such a pleasure to have a very special guest in Clarice Mack with us today and really excited to share her story with you all. But thank you so much for listening and thank you for subscribing as well. Uh, but of course, before we get into the interview, I want to go ahead and say hey to my dad. Hey, Pops, how you doing today? Hey, son, I'm excited to be here with another great American hero, Convos with Hero, Clarice Mack. And I know she's going to bring it because we've been talking already. I can't wait to get it on wax, as they say. Let's get it going. <laughs> Let's get it on wax. I love it. I love it. Oh, man. Well, yeah, yeah, everybody. I'm just excited to, to welcome Clarice. I'll go ahead and, and uh, tell you all a little bit about her before she uh, she goes in and starts telling her story. But, you know, Clarice Mack, she was born and raised in Orlando, Florida, where after graduating high school, she joined the U.S. Air Force. This was the beginning of her career where she ultimately spent 16 years serving within the Department of Defense working at the Pentagon within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, HQ Air Force, and other Air Force organizations. While she started off as an airman, she served in various capacities to include active duty service, contractor, and federal civilian service. Clarice spent most of her career in roles supporting information technology, security management, and operations. While on active duty, Clarice served in Balad, Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom during the first Iraqi elections back in 2005. Today, she works in the tech industry and lives in Northern Virginia uh, with her husband and daughter. While Clarice no longer works for DOD, she continues to selflessly serve by helping women and men transitioning from the service through coaching, resume assistance, and job search. Awesome. Clarice, so excited to have you on with us today. Hey, Gina, I'm incredibly happy to be here. Um, something fun to do outside my monotonous day-to-day -day job, right? Um, but I would like to call out uh, uh, Ranger and say, um, before, put it on wax is a little bit before our time, I think, Gino. So um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe a thumb drive or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know too much about putting it on wax. <laughs> <laughs> you see this gray beard, Clarice. Don't don't front. We've been talking. You know, you know my era. You know, I mean, you know, you know my era. So I'm gonna let you get away with that since you're a guest and just let you kind of tell your story. Cause I do want to hear about all this great background, everything you've been through. Yeah, I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, thank you for the intro. Uh, you, you pretty much covered it at, at a high level, but yep. Um, born and raised in Orlando, Florida. I'm biracial. My mother's white. My dad is black. Um, my mother's from France. Father is from a neat small town in Louisiana. Um, so I, I have a very diverse uh, background and upbringing. But um, uh, when I graduated high school, I, I had a full ride to go to the University of Central Florida, but I was dating someone at the time who was going through the, the recruiter process and I was tagging along. And through that process, I was like, man, this is something that um, I'm interested in. Like, I just felt that it was, there was a lot of purpose there. And I was motivated by the conversations that the guy I was dating at the time was having with the recruiter. So um, Despite having a, a full ride to go to the University of Central Florida, I ended up changing my plans at the last minute and, and um, enlisted within the Air Force. Um, there's some backstory where I actually had pursued the Army first, but my recruiter disappeared. And so uh, thankfully, um, I, uh, I was pursued by a different recruiter from the Air Force, and I regret nothing about pursuing the route of um, the United States Air Force. Um, so... Uh, you know, without going into detail, because I think we're going to talk a little bit about that in the interview, but um, I just, I did eight years. So my first assignment was at Hill Air Force Base, Utah, for a Floridian that was quite the culture shock. But <laughs> I think uh, that helps build the character, right? You know, they stick us in these places that we have zero familiarity with, especially as a young person coming up straight out of high school. But um, I met some of the most amazing people and friends through that assignment because there was nothing else to do other than enjoy each other's company <laughs> get into a little trouble here and there right but um i have some of the most amazing friends out of that assignment um later deployed to iraq as you previously mentioned um i did um the remainder of my career in, as active duty in the national capital region in the pentagon and um bowling air force base at the time um, and after eight years of service um, my priorities changed um, i'd gotten married i had a ch child and um, I had ended my, my, active, my enlistment 
in the air staff. And personally, and quite frankly, I couldn't fathom going back to squadron level or deploying or, you know, going, going to an assignment overseas, because like I said, my priorities had changed. I got married and I had, I had a daughter. Um, so from there, I, I did contracting for one year um, you know, with a defense contractor and then got picked up into federal service working for um, Department of Air Force again, where I did another eight years and in total did my 16. Um, I'm currently working in big tech. I'm actually only one year out of working in the Department of Defense. And um, that's probably another podcast, but the culture shock from working 16 years in uh, the defense culture and around men and women to then going into big tech is quite the leap. But um, I left the Department of Defense because I was looking for a new challenge and I'm getting exactly that. Wow. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm having a good time just listening to your story. And, and I want to go back on a couple of things you said. Um, I know a little bit about Utah. I went to Ranger School in a place called Dugway, Utah. Mm -hmm. And it was so cold. And I, look, I've been overseas in Germany. I was at Fort Lewis, Washington. I've never been so cold in my life. I'm talking about so cold that you, uh, the water in our canteen frozen Dugway, Utah. Really? Oh, yep. Wow. I can believe it. And I'm not making that up. It was, it was that cold. So I, I'm sitting there trying to imagine uh, a, a, a young, a young lady from Florida <laughs> getting to Utah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and and having to grow up uh, in, in that culture because, like I said, great people, but definitely different from Florida. And some of the things that you learned, man, what, what are some of the things you learned about yourself maybe during that time period that maybe you didn't know? Man, uh, you don't realize how young you are until you, like, sent off on your own, right? And And trying to figure things out clear across the country, right? In, in Utah from Florida. Um, you know what, the, the biggest thing I can say about what I learned is we adapt, right? I've never been in, uh, so I've been to, to New York and seen snow, but having to live in it, to figure out how to drive in the snow. And before I even had a car, cause I was only 18 years, old you know walk a couple miles to get to the office because I didn't have a car when I first joined but you yeah. adapt and you and you you build relationships with folks and figure out you know how to navigate a new place um and, and new culture and experience I mean Utah comes also with its own unique culture um, it is a very densely populated area of the Mormon religion. Um, I wasn't familiar with that prior to moving there. Um, mountains, right? <laughs> the geography of the area. Um, I'll tell you one thing I learned is that I'm not, uh, I'm not into hiking. <laughs> I never did um, get involved in hiking or skiing or anything like that while I was there because it's just, it was just too unfamiliar to me. Um, but Reflecting on that, I wish I had taken advantage of being in, in Utah and maybe learned how to ski while I was there, but uh, I wasn't uh, that bright at 18 to, to, to really take advantage of what was right before me. I got you. It's so amazing hearing you talk about that. Now, I don't feel bad, you know, 20 years in the Army and I've, you know, I've been in cold weather, I've skied, I've been in ice, I've done all that. And I love to share with people, the reason I live in South Louisiana, because it's not snow. And, um, <laughs> You know, after 20 years of laying by pine trees and freezing, I just decided I'm not going to ever do it again. I mean, yep. I just, that's, that's me personally. So I know you're up in Virginia and D.C. area and I get all that. God bless y'all and, mm -hmm. and, and anything. So, look, you go there, your next duty station, uh, you kind of jump to your next duty station. after you did, did you go straight to combat or what happened after you left Utah? Um, well, before I, before I left Utah, I did um, deploy to Iraq. Um, okay. So that was like my first move within the military. And so I served in Balad. Um, we, we spent a few months in IUD for a little bit. But um, so again, you know, teenager, um, I celebrated my 19th birthday, you know, in a deployed location. Um, the lessons learned there, right? Again, adaptability, um, camaraderie, you know, you're... I was on, uh, I think it was called Camp Anaconda. So it was a military um, compound. And so 
Um, you guys were intense. We were not. Um, you know, just realizing, man, that I really did make the right choice when I chose to go into the Air Force. <laughs> 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 was uh you know a good reflection while I was there um but uh, yeah so I, I deployed to to Iraq while I was um, assigned at Utah and then from there I um I volunteered for a special duty assignment in um, DC where I was uh, going to be a, an adjudicator so all those folks out there with clearances um, I was the person reading stacks of papers and investigations on whether or not you were suitable for a clearance in the in the Department of Defense so um that kind of was my 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 last assignment in the Air Force, because once I got to D.C., I just was able to, you know, move around to different um, units and organizations while in the area. Yeah. Oh, no. See, I'm reading between the lines. What she's saying, son, is when she got to the D.C. and she saw they was how they were living in D.C., she said, I ain't never going back to that again. I'm just going to break that down in common language for most people. <laughs> you said something a little bit about, about it earlier, but I'm going to break it down. But see, I, I'm giving you props because... Uh, I get it, you know. Uh, I was actually stationed in Berlin, Germany in 1982 to 84, and they had an Air Force base there called Tempelhof Air Base. Uh, and, it, and it was the history was actually where Hitler had airplanes and all that, and it's very, very incredible history. But being in the Army, we would go there on Fridays because they had steak and lobster <laughs> in the mess hall. And I used to go there and, and I said, oh, Air Force people live like this? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's a different, it's different. It's a whole, the Army and the Air Force are two different worlds, and they don't meet in any way, shape, form, or fashion until I was jumped out of an air, uh, an airplane. That's it. Yep, <laughs> you know, that's right. That, that, that was it. So, yeah, you can't even compare Air Force billets and barracks and food and anything to the army i guarantee you that right uh it's a fact it's definitely a fact like i said it was a, a reflection for me that wow i guess i did make the right decision by choosing to go to the air force <laughs> oh no doubt about it no doubt about it okay so you're there in dc you're, you're looking around you're seeing all these different opportunities and you're thinking wait a minute um i'm I'm going to jump off right now and do something else with my life. Was that a big challenge? And the reason I'm asking that, because you, you said something about going from, you know, contract and work with the military to civilian. And I can tell you straight up, uh, I've been retired 22 years. I'm still not civilianized. I've only had one civilian job for two years, a major company, and that's it. I've worked for myself other than that. Okay. Uh, how did you deal with that part of it, the change, the shift? Yeah, I think it's um, a good a good start to how I ultimately ended up helping others with their resume and stuff, right? So, um, like I said, my priorities had changed. Um, I was, at, at this point, married and had a, a daughter. Um, I was waddling around the Pentagon, right, until I had my daughter and, and like just things changed when she came and my priorities. Um, you know, when you're married um, and your spouse is not in dual service, you have to decide whether that person is going to have to sacrifice their career and their aspirations because as the active duty member, your, pri your role is priority, right? If you've got to go to another state, another country, then the family's got to go. And so um, my husband and I talked about it and, and I personally didn't want him to have to sacrifice his career um, and have to pick up and go every time I PCS. So um, to be quite literally frank, I was terrified because again, I, I joined the, the Air Force as a, a teenager and um, it's what I knew. And yeah. when I went in and I, I'll tell you after my first assignment, I was convinced that I was going to do 20 years. I was incredibly passionate about service and what my job, I loved being um, in the military. I, I just knew I was going to retire. Right. But um, when those priorities changed, I, um, I just started letting people know like, Hey, I'm thinking about getting out. Do you have any advice for me? And I'll tell you, yeah. if it weren't for the, the phenomenal leadership that I was surrounded around in the Pentagon, um, the man, the um, superintendents and the staff sergeants that I worked for in the past that still kept in touch with me, who 
help me with resume writing and just kind of like, you can do this, you can transition. If it weren't for them, I probably wouldn't have been as successful in the transition because I was very scared, right? I had an infant and I didn't know anything else. I didn't know how to interview. I didn't know how to do any of that. And while the military gives you resources and they send you to classes, the TAPS, you know, to help you transition, it doesn't work, you know, you still have to put in the work, you still have to present yourself and you still have to, you know, figure out how to translate everything that you've done in the military into civilians, into the civilian sector. So um, anyways, I had a great support system that helped me build my resume and encouraged me to tell everyone that you're transitioning so that they know you're open for employment, right? And as a result, um, I didn't even apply for the first contractor job that I ended up getting. Someone wow. passed my resume around and a, and a um, program manager reached out to me and said, hey, I'd like to meet with you. I'll never forget it. Um, I met in the Sobraros in the Pentagon. It's still there if anyone's familiar with that Sobraros pizzeria. But um, I met in the, in the Sobraros in uniform. I go meet with this strange man and he's like, hey, I read your resume you know, I really think that you do great joining this organization, you know, leading, you know, business operations and whatnot. And I was just like, great. You know, like I, I didn't really have to work for it. And I'll tell you, right. um, it, it's not the advice that I would give to someone transitioning, but I, I accepted that first offer. I accepted that first job, right? Cause um, you've been, you, yeah, you were leaving without a job. You're like, oh God, I got a job. Yeah, I got a job and I didn't even have to interview for it. Uh, well, I mean, I interviewed, but like yeah. I didn't I didn't have to go all over and, and, and go to job fairs and all that kind of stuff. But it was the work that I put into on writing a resume, getting other people to review it and provide feedback um, and passing passing it along and letting people know that, hey, I'm leaving the service. And you'd be surprised like. People want to help. People are well connected. And the more networking you do, the more chances, in my opinion, that you have in getting where you want to go. And so that's how I initially got uh, to my contracting job. Wow. You said a lot in that. And, and, and I want to continue on the contracting just a little bit. But we get we don't get a lot of female veterans on on these uh, calls just because of just the numbers alone. Uh, you know, the percentage of female service. So I want to go back to something you said, you know, being pregnant in the military, having to think about deployment. See, this is something I never had to deal with. I deployed, but my wife wasn't in. And so my mind, you know, in 20 years was never on that. You know, it's like, hey, we got orders. I'm out. I'm gone. Yeah. I'm jumping out of an airplane. I'm here. But just psychologically, I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, you, you're, you're, you're an airman. You're in the military, your wife, you're pregnant. Man, take us through that piece of just, that had to be, because even now I'm going, wow, that's a lot to think about. Yeah, definitely. Um, having already deployed, I knew exactly what it was like and what to expect. And right. so fast forward, having a family now, I, I, I couldn't process it, right? So if I yeah. stay in, I'm gonna have to leave my daughter behind with him. No, right, like my husband is great and he's, but yeah. I couldn't process like leaving her behind and you know, the what ifs, right? Now granted, women do it, men and women do it every single day, right? But I personally have struggled with, with the idea, right? And, and, it, and I knew that I wasn't gonna be happy if I had to continuously right. deploy and leave my family behind. And so that's why when it was my turn to make a choice or whether to re-enlist or not, I chose to, to separate and, and move on. But it's tough, right? Um, I, I'm well connected in the military still. I have lots of friends who are still in or coming up on retirement actually, who have, have missed, you know, milestones of their children's lives, right? Whether that's first day of kindergarten or birthdays or they're sick and their mom or their dad can't be there because they're deployed, right? And um, that's just not something that I wanted to experience. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, one of the reasons we call this Convos with Heroes because the average civilian doesn't even understand it. No, nope. I mean, they, they have no connection with that story. That's why I wanted mothers will understand what you just said. 
And because, you know, it's so difficult when you're in. I can remember late in my career, you know, after 20 years, I was in you know, 11 years of the Green Beret, range retaining, I'm deploying, I'm doing all that. When I got late in my career and my kids started getting older, uh, I started thinking about that, you know, the same thing. I, and, if you, and if you think about, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, right? But if you think about how far technology has come, we didn't have oh. FaceTime. We didn't have all this, all these capabilities to where you can literally pick up the phone and talk to your loved ones. So it was much different, you know, before you had all of this video teleconferencing and, and literally Wi-Fi around the world. So um you know, to put that, so put that in perspective when you're thinking about folks being deployed and not having any contact with their family. Oh, no, it's amazing. You know, I laugh all the time because my youngest son's in the Navy right now and he's, he's overseas and he FaceTime me and, me and his mom the other day. And it's great to look at him on the phone and say, what's up, son? How you going? I mean, it makes me feel so good as a dad, right? You know, back when I was in, and it's going to take you, Clarice, this is going to just mess up your whole game. <laughs> Back in 1982, when I was in Berlin, Germany, I can remember calling home on the battalion phone, like, uh, you know, we're eight hour time difference. And I and I go to the battalion in midnight and I make a phone call home to my mama and talk to everybody during Christmas because of yeah. eight hour time period. And I'm talking on the phone to them and they can't see me. And I'm sending a cassette tape to talk to them. Crazy, crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah. Now, look, yep. when you got out, I can tell right now, I mean, a person like you, you're highly motivated, you're energetic, you had that one job. What led you to the next one after you got finished with that job, the, the initial job you had? And did you put thought in the value you bring to the table? Okay, did, did you put more thought into your next move after that first job? Well, before I talk about going to the next job, let me tell you some lessons learned. Oh, yes. especially especially for enlisted folks who okay. are transitioning um you spoke about national capital region right like it's a high cost of living right so your bah and your bas and all that is is relatively high folks forget or they don't know that when you transition that's not your total like that's not considered in your taxable income so when you get that really what you would think is a high paying contractor job when you transition and then Uncle Sam hits your paycheck or when you go to file your taxes and you don't realize that you weren't making the necessary deductions and having your affairs in order, you can end up paying a whole lot of money. And let me tell you, enlisted officer, it doesn't matter. It affects people at all the time who are transitioning out. However, an army colonel, retired colonel talked to me knowing that I had just recently transitioned from being an E5 into a contractor and said, right. look, Clarice, you need to go, you need to make sure that you handle your taxes and you realize that your income is going to be taxed differently from the way it was taxed in when you were in the service. And I think I still, I'm still in contact with him today, but I, I will forever be grateful to him for telling me that because when I did do, file my taxes, I avoided paying like $10,000 in, in taxes because I had his advice. And so now today, when I meet with people who are transitioning, I always remind them that when you're thinking about two things, right? Um, how much you need to make, you know, take into consideration all of the benefits that you're earning in the military, not just your base salary, take into account the BAS, the BAH, the cost that you don't even realize is in a cost, which is your health care, right? You don't have a payroll deduction to, to receive health care when you're in the military. But guess what? When you go get that job, whatever that salary is, you need to remember that you're going to have a payroll deduction to have receive medical care, right? Because not everyone's retiring and getting TRICARE, right? So we're talking mm -hmm. separate teeth here. Um, so the taxes and just realizing how much you truly need to make on the outside. Mm with consideration of taxes and medical payroll deduction and, and stuff like that. Like a lot of folks transitioning just don't get that education when they're in TAPS or when they're transitioning out of the service. So oh. lesson learned there when I was a contractor, right? Like just tax implications and, and how much salary you really should be negotiating for. Because unfortunately, I learned this later in my civilian service, um, mm -hmm. there's program managers out there that work for these contracts that are 
for profit. And they take advantage of transitioning military who don't know how to negotiate, who don't know how much money they truly are worth or how much they truly should be making when you leave as an E9 or E5 or O5, whatever, you know, like it affects all walks of life in the military. They, they take advantage. And so if you're not educated and if you don't know what to ask for in your self-worth, they're going to, they're going to take advantage of that. So um, mm-hmm. definitely learn that in my, tra- in my contracting period. Um, but look, um, I was passionate about being in the Air Force when I was active duty, and I was just as passionate, even though I had transitioned to being a contractor. Um, so I definitely kept, I was, I was eager to become a civil servant so that I can kind of be like back in the game, you know, in the Pentagon and, and feel closer to um, the military folks that I had pretty much grown up with. And so that was my motivation for wanting to become a, um, a federal service. And I just kept applying. Um, and fortunately, which is very traditional in this area, there was a civilian position that became open in the, in the office that I was already working in. And so I competed for that role and I ended up getting a, a government job right in the office that I was a contractor. Not the same role, but in the same organization. Right. Wow. That is fantastic. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at myself because I'm listening to you tell a precautionary tale about taxes. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you straight up, you know, uh, you know, when I retired, I started working for myself as a motivational speaker. Mm-hmm. And of course, I, I was making more money than I ever made before. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. didn't know about those taxes. Mm-hmm. But let me tell you something. I learned <laughs> real quick about the IRS. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something, again, it's not just contracting with the military. It's contractors like me that was out here speaking and getting paid. I'm like, they gave me all this money. They didn't give me all that money. Part no. of that money should have been put aside for the IRS. And it believe should. me, I learned my lesson. I mean, like you said, I had the structure. I had the discipline. I had the passion and the drive. But certain things in business that we did not that we did not know. Now, I know you said you help people with resumes and you got, you got a business that you do. Uh, Tell, tell us about that if you got a website and tell us tell us what you do give give us some so people can reach out to you tell us a little bit about what you do in other words i'm coming to you I, let, let's make it real ranger johnson i'm retired army you know e8 first sergeant i've never written a resume i don't know nothing about it Clarice. <laughs> i mean you can't don't treat me like i know because i don't what are you going to do for me yeah, so um, first of all, uh, let me make it clear that I am 100% volunteer, volunteer, like people oh, know God. me through word of mouth, right? Um, I helped someone and that person told someone and like over the years, people have just either shared my name or folks that I've maintained contact with through the military who are now transitioning or, or retiring okay. have asked, you know, hey, you separated as an enlisted member, went contracting, came a civil servant, did well in civil service, and now you're in big tech. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Mm -hmm. you know something that will lead to some sort of success, right? And so that's their opinion. Like, I I just think, uh, you know, I've had really great people around me to help support and and, um, lead me to the roles and the opportunities that I've had. But, um, you know, one of the most important things I think we can do as, as humans and and having served is just pay it forward right and so i i I love helping people it it gives me so much purpose to see people transition from the service or whatever you know i've helped people who are federal service members who just um want a new job right and help them with their resume um great satisfaction in seeing people like land that job that they're they're trying to get or um learn like a better way to write their resume um so I, like I said, when I was transitioning out of the Pentagon, I had a lot of people help me, um, mentor me, coach. I mean, I'm talking some si- significantly high senior leaders who took the time to invest in me and talk to me and review my resume and say, hey, this is what you should change. This is what you should do. Um, or previous managers who, who helped guide me. And so from those experiences, I, did, I just try to pay it forward and do the exact same thing for people who come to me asking me for help. So um 
you know, so let's say uh, coaching, resume writing, and and job search is are the three things that I typically get asked to help with. So from the coaching perspective, I think people fail to realize, like, despite the courage and the strength and, and discipline that you need to have to be in the military, our folks lack confidence when it's time to talk about how freaking amazing they are and what they can do and what they can offer an employer as it relates to ability to be trained, you know, integrity. Um, we can learn just about anything. We have to do it every two to three years anyway, right? Ability to adapt to different cultures and, and work environments under stress, under low stress. You know, we have so much to offer. And time and time again, I'm talking to military members who do not have the confidence to say what the heck they can do. And so just really like talking them through Hello, read your read what you have in your resume. This is amazing. You just need to articulate it. It always uh, shocks me when I, it doesn't matter. Enlisted, officer, I have talked to yeah. all of them who are incredibly uh, humble, I, I, sometimes humble or just not as confident in like what they have achieved through military yeah. service. And what they have to offer. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, what they need, I mean, what they have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. No. And, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, again, I've only worked one civilian job for two years uh, since I've been, I've been retired 22 years, but I learned a lot at that civilian job. And one of the mm -hmm. things I learned as a manager from, from a major company is, yeah, that go get it mentality, take no prisoners, make it happen, right? <laughs> and being that, I also learned in the civilian world uh, not saying everywhere, but many people I work with went to work not to work. <laughs> they, they went to work not to work. And I get there as this retired Army guy every day, like, hey, let's go. Let's get it. You know, let's do this. <laughs> and, and really, I, you know, I was able to motivate my team and do things like that. But, but I know, in fact, uh, like you were saying, a lot of military people just don't know how to verbalize. Listen, mm -hmm. this is what I do. Having me on the team is going to make your team better. You got to have me because I'm a winner. I'm going to help everybody win. I mean, I can tell you, Clarice, I can tell you do that. See, you ain't never going to have a problem getting a job. I can tell right now. <laughs> well, so so there's that. And then, trans, as, you, as you know, translating those military skills into recognizable skills in the, in the civilian sector. Um, it, it's a challenge, and I don't think I can't. Excuse me. You got oh, oh, you got a friend down there. You got a friend. I got a friend. Um, <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see your friend since you're saying hi to us. You, okay. I, I can't speak for all transitioning military. Ooh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get him. Okay, real. go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. That's fine. You can take care of that. This, you know, this quick, is a podcast. Uh, <laughs> the dog had to get taken care hey, of. Is, we'll be back uh, shortly, uh, everyone. <laughs> the things that happen uh, remote work eh, don't go away just because you're on a podcast. That's right. right? That's right. Kids, That's right. Dogs, the spouses, all that fun stuff. Technical difficulties, yeah. but um, I'm back. Um, trans, um, I can't speak for all func um, services across military installations, but I'll speak from my own um, experience. Um, I don't think there's enough time given to explaining how to or teaching members how to translate their skills right. right it's especially if you're not in a medical or admin or front office type role like these infantry folks and, and you know it's difficult to to translate what they can do to the civilian sector well I think you know being in that field I was infantry and special forces uh your leadership you know, let me yeah. tell you what I understand about, about the civilian world. And of course, I've been a contract out here for 22 years doing it and, and with many different organizations. Um, leadership, teaching, if you you need a leader in every organization, you know, yeah. you got to have you a Clarice Mack in every organization if you're trying to be successful. You really yeah. do. You, because what one thing I know about Clarice, I'm talking to you like third person. If you're if you in that organization, you're going to make, you'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about the military, the military teaches you to, to adapt, overcome, improvise, and figure it out. The, the military did not always give you A, B, C, D answers. 
it's A. Oh, let's go to Z. We got to come back to W. Oh, it it's not really like that. No, but this is how we're going to accomplish a mission. Mm -hmm. And so to me, when I, when I meet somebody like yourself, I'm saying, look, they could put them in any company. It, it really doesn't matter. Somebody like yourself could make it work anywhere, anywhere you land just because of those skills. Yep. And I'm, and, and I'm sure those are some of the things that you talk to people about. Yep. So, so coaching them through that confidence and how to really articulate their skills and translate them into the civilian sector. And then um, resumes, right? We have, a, we are notorious for putting, oh, I got quarter of the, you know, soldier of the year, soldier of the quarter and like all this stuff. Like they don't understand what that means. Like you can take out a lot of that military jargon and really condense our resumes into a, you know, no more than three pages. Sometimes I'm getting resumes that are 10 pages long and they've got every single training, everything from uh, first aid to, you know, how to close up the secure facility. Like you don't need to list all that stuff. <laughs> I'm laughing at me because that's like my resume when I first started. I'm like, did you see my resume when I first, because that's what we know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. first sergeant, I went to first sergeant school, you know, special forces weapons training, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm laughing at myself while you're talking because I'm like, oh my God, did Clarice read my resume? She's <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's consistent. I get a lot of resumes that are so long, that have so much words and, 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 and uh, material that really just don't translate. And so it's hard for a, a hiring manager to look at that and really see, okay, what is this person, what can this person do specifically for this job? So condensing the resume, making it more specific for the um, civilian sector and aligning it to the job in which they are applying, right? People think one and done, and there's no such thing. You have to make sure you tailor your resume for that job because you want to show and communicate how you you specifically can fit the roles and responsibilities for the for the job in which you're applying um okay so that was coaching resume and then job search give right? me one so, give me on the resume i got a question for you i got a question i got a question now how do you recommend one page resume no more than one because you don't want people to read three pages to, give me what you recommend and how long a resume should be. Like if I, if, if you know these managers ain't gonna sit there and read ten pages, you know no, that. They're not. They're not. So t tell me what you recommend as a professional. I recommend going back no further than ten years and condensing it to two pages max. Okay. I uh, and and I and look, I didn't know this out the gate. They you know they won. Like I, I have learned over the years on like how right. to continue like it's continuous you're always going to be evolving your resume and tweaking it um as you progress in your career so um 16 years i don't need to really mention that i was in iraq you know way right. back then right um so you know just always keeping it updated and not having anything beyond 10 years two pages max right right that's amazing. That's amazing. Now, look, I got to go back. I know you mentioned your dad's name. I didn't get your mom's name. You talk about Larry Evans from A Neat, Louisiana. For yeah. the people that don't know, I do live in South Louisiana, and I know exactly where A Neat, Louisiana is. Uh, some of the things that your dad came up or your mom taught you growing up, you know, I mean, that had to help you in, in your life also. Absolutely. Um, so... I think out the gate, it would be that accept any, everyone, right? My mom and dad were dating and got married in a period where interracial relationships weren't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, highlighted, right? And so right. Um, my grandfather, my mother's father was a soldier. Um, he married, you know, someone overseas, I said my mother was from France. Um, didn't necessarily agree with with my mother um, dating and then later marrying my father who who was an African American, and so um, from them and from their union, right? Love is blind, um, and, and accept accept everyone, right? No matter what walk of life they come from, there's a lot of power within diversity. I'll speak for myself and say, hey, look. Those two human beings brought me into this world and 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 here I am, right? There's there's positivity in 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 having a uh, a love that is pure. 
Did you, now you say your mom's French. Did you grow up speaking French? I didn't. Uh, my mom, uh, uh, because she her her father was a U.S. soldier, she ended up getting you know moved around, and she quickly uh, lost her her. She she quickly became Americanized. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. That is fascinating. Now you talked about your daughter. Can I ask how old is your daughter right right now? You have one child, or you have any more? One child, my daughter is 12, she'll be 13 later on this year, and I am going through the preteen years and, and trying to figure out, like, how do I navigate young girl and social media and, like, image and all of that, so, uh, yeah, 12 going on 13. <laughs> wow, that, 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 you know what, that's fascinating, and that's a talk with, I know you're a coach and the social media, and we talk about that with my wife and I, because we do ministry, and she talks to girls, I talk to boys, and just that whole piece is different now, because with young people, you're on your cell phone all the time, I mean, you're looking at, you know, everybody else telling you this and telling you that about yourself, I mean, it goes into some of the things you even talking about, about military guys, you understanding your value, and teaching, and teaching, that just you know how are you processing that even you know with your daughter and teaching other other people that you're dealing with just their value uh it's tough um there's there's a lot of risk with giving your child access one having a phone and having access to social media um i'll tell you you're already at 12 years old she's had strange people pretend that they are young people and try to play games, you know, like the virtual games and, you know, right. really explaining to her that you cannot trust everything you see and everyone that you meet, you know, you need to really make sure that you're practicing, you know, you're being safe on the internet and the people that you're interacting with and being comfortable to come and talk to your parents when you're not sure of something, because I, I don't know what I did when I was her age, but I tell you one thing, when they don't know something, they go on the internet and they look it up. And it doesn't right. matter what the topic is. And you know, the internet will is unfiltered. It will, it will spit out whatever it is that they, they think you're trying to look up. And it is incredibly scary, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so building that trust with your, with your child and having that, mm -hmm. being, being disciplined enough to be calm if your kid comes to you with some, something that you may or may not think that they should be talking about or even inquiring right. about. Um, it takes great discipline on the adults part and, and courage on the on the kids part. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll just speak for my my experience. My husband is I'm the type who's like, oh my, you know what? Why you? And and he's yeah. like, Clarice, she's never gonna come and talk to you if every time she brings something to your attention, you're freaking out, right? And so, just realizing that you need to you know have that trust and 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 not be so reactive if your kid comes to you with something or if they get in trouble, right? Because yeah. they're gonna yeah. get in trouble. They're not going to be perfect. Now, I'm loving the conversation because, like I said, we get very few females on the call. And so you're dealing in the mother. mother. Is, your, is your husband in the military? Was he ever in the military? Or can, can I ask? Yeah, um, he and I met while while I was in um, at Utah, uh, but he he did four years and then he he uh, separated because when I took the special duty to the dis to the D.C. area, his uh, job specialty was not available in the national capital region. Yeah. His yeah. role, his yeah. job was very specific. It was only available in a couple states throughout the U.S. and overseas. And um, so he, at the time, made a sacrifice for me and said, "Hey, you're way more passionate about this. Um, I'm gonna separate and and join you in D.C. and we'll figure it out." And so he did four years and he got out and um, uh, currently is working for the U.S. Treasury Department. Yeah, man, that, that is, I mean, you talk about the sacrifice. A lot of people don't even understand the sacrifice that military families make. And just right off the bat, I mean, you talked about even, you know, being pregnant and, you know, maybe loved and wanted to retire and wanted to do 20 years in the Air Force to sacrifice mm -hmm. your career. And even your husband, you know, he may have wanted to do 20, but sacrifice that just to be with you. I mean, this is why I tell folks all the time, when you look at military people, they do so much that most people have no idea and won't have to give up, yeah. right? I mean, you know, and, and, and this is a primary example, even this conversation we're having right now where people can see, wow, I mean, it's just fascinating. Yeah, and, and um, again, like policies and accommodations are, are slow to 
to uh, support families and women, right? So when I was pregnant in the Air Force, um, I was expected to return to duty after six week of six weeks of delivering a child, right? Now they give, I think they're up to 12 or six months or something like that. And they give the spouse time to bond and help with the child, right? These are the things that people never thought of or cared to incorporate into policy up until recent times, which is crazy <laughs> because any doctor will tell you that depending on how you deliver that child, your body isn't even able to, isn't even healed. Some women can't walk, can't drive yeah. A, a, yeah. within three weeks, let alone return to work in six. And so um, yeah. it's, it's happening, but it's, it's taken too long to uh, update the policies and put into place um, the procedures and things that support both male and females in, in service. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm laughing again with you. Uh, my, again, my youngest son's in the Navy and when him and his wife had their baby, I can remember uh, coming to visit in DC when they were stationed up there and he ended up getting off for two weeks or a month or something. I'm like, you don't leave? He's like, no, dad, I'm on, I don't want to say maternity. I don't know what they call it. I don't know the name maternity of it. Maternity leave, right, what right. What do they call it? I'm like, wait a minute. Your wife had a baby and you get maternity leave? When did they start doing this? I mean, I thought it was great. <laughs> I mean, I thought, you know. well, look, look I, I appreciate you um, acknowledging that you haven't had many women on the show. And like, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this is the, the start of maybe more women joining, but there's just things that you, no, you guys just couldn't have the pers there's perspective on. Like, for example, cool, I got six weeks of maternity leave. Hm, I barely could figure out how am I going to take a shower with yeah. and by myself because the baby is here the baby starts crying who's gonna help me i gotta jump out the shower like there were times yeah. where i was like what am i gonna do and so i remember waiting the whole day until my husband would get home before i could go and do things that i needed to do because i was stuck with the baby all day right and so giving the paternity leave to the spouse is important because you two together need to bond with the baby, help with the baby, right? It's not all supposed to be on the on the woman or or the you know whatever the situation is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I mean, when that when that dude right there was born, I think went to the hospital. He was born the next week or so. I was probably out in the field somewhere. I was in, I was in a range battalion. You know exactly. when Gino was born. So. It wasn't, it wasn't no bonding. You're going to bond with a parachute on your back and a rucksack and you deploy. I mean, it wasn't no such thing. I, I mean, uh, really, I, I mean, I can't imagine being in, you know, serving in the Ranger Battalion and going to my commander. I mean, I, I would wonder, I wonder if they even do that because that's right. what a high speed unit. And I'm sure they probably do it now, but wow. Uh, Dad, you know, going to my commander, sir, uh, I need to go bond with my son for six weeks. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's hey, true. Look, it's true. It's true. Hey, <laughs> look, look. I'll even tell you. While the six weeks was a given, right? I actually took. I want to say three months in total because I used my own leave time um, when I had my daughter. But when I returned to the Pentagon, I was still nursing. But I didn't. I didn't continue nursing because the ops, the tempo was too fast, and I couldn't. I, I wasn't afforded the opportunity to pump and do the things that I needed to continue yes, yes. Uh, nursing, right? And so yeah. people don't think about that, right? Like yeah. the, when you go back to the field or you go back to the military, like it's just go, 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 go in the daytime. And like people aren't thinking like, oh shoot, she needs to take a break because she needs to go pump or whatever. And so, you know, these are the things that people don't necessarily think about. Um, and there's pros and cons to it. Some people think that that's why women shouldn't serve in combat, but um, you know, there's all, all types of uh, opinions out there on, on the, the yeah. power of uh, being able to deliver children and then continue to serve. Oh no, I've had some, you know, one of my assignments in, in when I was the first sergeant, you know, for, for the majority of my career, I was not around any females. I mean, I'm talking about <laughs> probably 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, probably 16 and then I got a first sergeant assignment where I actually had some female soldiers and and I learned quite a bit 
right? Mm -hmm. And I had some incredible sergeants that, that were women that were just mm -hmm. top of the line. I'm talking about soldiers that, that, that helped me tremendously. Yep. And, and, you know, it's just a value because the reason I think you need male and female, your brains are different. You're going to look at something differently. Like me dealing with my wife now, you know, I may have one straight way through a baby. Have you looked at it like this? Like, no, I never thought of it like that. And, and it's, this we, you know, you bring, like you bring value and a different thinking that, that, that we don't bring. So I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, there's definitely power in diversity. Um, you know, just having different uh, diverse in thought, diverse in perspectives and backgrounds, like it just allows you to, to, to go further when you have a diverse group of people working towards the same goal. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So talk about, you know, I'm gonna wrap up my, my questioning with this. I'm just having a good time, by the way, because I mean, I'm, I'm loving this conversation. This is incredible. Talk, talk about just some mentors, you know, that you had uh, maybe in your career or uh, in your life that gave you great direction and things like that, that you were able to use if you can. I mean, you don't have to say, say their names or you can. I mean, whatever you want to do. Any, anything about some of the mentors that helped you? Yeah, certainly. Um, one of my mentors, I mentioned his name was Chris Baker. Um, he was like, he was our E8 um, and my first assignment, uh, still really, really close friends to this very day. Um, he was the type of, uh, leader who wouldn't always give me the answer. I'm, I'm a very inquisitive person. You know, mm -hmm. I would, you know, I think the army has already has this opinion or this perception, but I always needed to know why. <laughs> So I would ask him, well, why, you know, why do we need to do it this way? And I would always push back and give him a hard time. And he would always push me to go look it up, go and look it up in the, in the, in the, in the regulation or the instruction to understand what the actual policy is before you come and ask me questions. Why? Right. Okay. And so I would like, I believe that because he always forced me to go look, it, it was, it kind of tapped into my desire to always learn and mm -hmm. understand um, my role, uh, the organization, you know, no matter what it was, just like, go always find out the information for yourself so that right. you can have the knowledge you need to, to do whatever the task is or, the, or answer the questions that you may have. Um, so um, I really learned a lot from him by him pushing me to look into the why of, of mm -hmm. anything. Um, but he was always patient. Um, again, I was very inquisitive. And so he had to have patience with me. He could have easily just said, because, right, move on. Like, you need mm -hmm. to do it because I said so. But he was right. patient. He explained to me, um, no matter what was going on in my life or the other troops' life, um, you know, he would take the time to help us. Um, when I was transitioning, I'll tell you of all the people, he probably was one of the ones that spent the most time helping me revise my resume. He had retired many, many, many years prior to me. And so he had lessons learned that he paid forward to me to help me be successful. Um, but one thing I'll, I'll, I'll end on talking about Chris is um, he had a, a tactful way of keeping me humble, right? So when I was on my first assignment, um, I did well. I got awards. I was recognized. Um, you know, like I had, I was well decorated for my first assignment. Let's say that. Mm -hmm. When I called him and I said, hey, Sergeant Baker, I'm coming to DC. I'm so excited. Um, he, he was like, okay, you're going to go in the Pentagon? He's like, I need you to understand. When you were at Hill, you did well. But the Pentagon is the cream of the crop. You're going to be surrounded by people who applied for special duties, who competed to get into the Pentagon. So humble yourself and, and realize you may get in there and not be the, the top of the top, right? Um, and I don't know, at the moment, I, I, when he said it to me, I was like, what? Like, I'm, I'm me. Like, I'm going to do great. Right. <laughs> but it definitely made me humble myself and go into the new role in the new environment like the pentagon is completely different than than what you can experience at the base level right um so i feel like that kind of honest feedback helped me prepare for the role also when i went to leadership school 
um, he, he also, he, he did the same thing. He was like, we realized like everyone who got selected to go to that leadership school is the top 1%. Like they are all, they're kicking butt and they're, they're trying to get promoted and, and they are successful in co- their career. So don't think you're going to go in there and be top notch, you know? And um, I'll never forget the day I called him and I, I said, hey, Chris, uh, Sergeant Baker at the time, um, I got the, I got the, the top grad award. And he was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Because he spent so much time trying to make sure that I was humble mm-hmm. and setting expectations. And then I actually graduated like at the top of the class. And he was right. just like, are you serious? And so um, I think that has, has been a really uh, a great benefit to our relationship and our mentorship is that he has kept me humble and um, um, never led me to believe that anything was going to be easy. Awesome. That's great. Awesome. Man. Awesome, man. It's been so good listening to your, your interview over here, Clarice, and hearing just so much about your career. I want, I want to go and ask you just a couple couple other questions kind of to get some uh, the folks listening, some additional advice, because I know you got a lot, a lot in your pocket and we got to get it all out there. <laughs> um, one question I have for you is what's the most important lesson you've learned over your career? Hmm. I would say that you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we look at leaders and we look at peers and we come up with these these false impressions that they know everything and they're the smartest, right? When in actuality, um, everybody's trying to figure it out, right? And so over my career, I have realized that we place a lot of uh, we come up with stories around people in leadership positions and just assume that they're the smartest people in the room. And, and I've been in, in leadership roles myself. And, and I have to remind people like, no, like if we were the smartest people in the room or if they were the smartest people in the room, we wouldn't need the team. We wouldn't need the other people around me. So I would say that right. definitely a lesson is just realizing that you as an individual don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Um, you need to leverage others and, and build upon the knowledge of other people around you. That's gold. There, there's just too much information out there for you to try to be the smartest person on everything, right? And so you yeah. have to leverage the knowledge and experience of others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like that. You get that synergy, right? When you work with a lot of different people, everybody has their information and knowledge, but you come together, you can do even more than what even those, what you would imagine those two people or however many people could do. By coming together. And, and you don't work as hard. Like I'm all about working, not working super hard, right? I may have a sign behind me that says work hard and be nice, but like, I don't like to work hard. And so if you can get other people to bring in their talent so that you guys can work easier and smarter, I'm all for it. I like, I like that sign. I, you, make, you guys are definitely making me want to want to go ahead and put some up on my wall up here. I feel like I need to put some up here. It's like blank. <laughs> and I got to window over don't here. Me, don't give me too much credit because I'm, I'm, I've been in this house for two years and I'm slowly trying to decorate. So this is my one little sign. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. I like it. It's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> it is. All right. Next question I got for you is um, what's one lesson that your job and your career taught you uh, that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? So anything that you learned from the military that you think everybody should learn at some point in their life? Oh, um, I think a lot of military listeners may disagree with me, but we'll see. But I think um, the lesson that failure is an option. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, or you hear like failure is not an option. Well, it should be an option because if you failed at something, you you, you have learned from whatever it is that you felt that you learned something. There was a lesson learned there. So um, I think just realizing that if you make mistakes and if you, you don't get it right the first time or if you don't, you know, succeed in some sort of project or whatever that you're responsible for, it's okay because you learned something from that and you won't repeat whatever those mistakes were um, in your next, your next challenge. So I, I really believe uh, l- learning that failure is an option. I love that. I love that. We just, we just had an interview, actually, uh, me and my dad, and I, I brought that up. But, you know, we talked about failure was mentioned. And I was like, hey, you know, it's not you either you, you succeed or you learn, right? And you learn from Yes, that. I've never heard it said that way. Absolutely. You, yes. 
you got you always got to learn from those those mistakes and you learn a lot of times you learn the most from the the the, the tough situations right we just talked to another vet who talked about <laughs> leadership and how you tend to learn the most from the bad leaders. You learn, you tend to learn the most from the, 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 the real challenging situation that happened to you. Exactly. How you don't want to be. And you remember how that person made you feel or how that person made the organization chaotic, right? You learn from those, those not so great leaders. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to be like that. I'm not going to do that. That's what I know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Clarice, all right, well, I'm going to end it with this, uh, our final question that we always love to ask. And, you know, first of all, just thank you so much for what you've done, your service, you're really helping transitioning vets. I think with that, that tax, you know, me being a CPA and active, by the way, in case anybody, I'm, I'm an inactive CPA, I went inactive last year, but, uh, but thinking about taxes, although I am a CPA, I did not, ex- I don't have expertise in taxes, so just FYI, but I was like, wow, that is really interesting stuff and good, that's going to, I mean, you, like you mentioned, $10,000 that you saved, like, I mean, that's huge. So given that great insights and really helping veterans in a volunteer capacity is really amazing. So I appreciate what you're doing. Um, But, you know, our final question is, you know, when your life is over, what do you want people to remember you for? What kind of legacy do you want to leave here? Um, I like to think of myself as um, relatively selfless, right? I'm not a selfish person. I, I have given in so many ways, whether that's family, whether that's folks transitioning PCS thing, you can ask anybody. I've had so many families stay for a couple of weeks because they were PCSing to another place. I, 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 I'm always um, open to helping others. And so I would say, um, I would want people to remember me for helping others succeed. Mm, wow. That's great. Well, man, you're definitely on that road, Clarice. I definitely see that desire to help others and what you're doing and being selfless is really amazing. Thank you so much for being on this podcast with us. And uh, I'll pass over to my dad to close it out for us. We have had an incredible time talking to this American hero, Clarice Mack, originally from Orlando, Florida. And she (laughs) said her daddy, by the way, of A Meat, Louisiana. I had to throw that in there since I live not too far from there. But let me tell you, it's been an awesome time talking to her today. She's an incredible hero. And this is Ranger Johnson telling you to stay in the fight!